Hello and welcome. I'm Arnand Naidu sitting in for Riz Khan. When is it legitimate for the oppressed to take up arms and resist injustice? Are the words democracy and progress being used today to justify exploitation and suppress dissent? These are just some of the issues that my guest today, Arundhati Roy, has been wrestling with for years. Ms. Roy is a world-renowned author from India who is, at the same time, one of her country's harshest critics. She's advocated for social and economic justice worldwide and has been a forceful voice for the poor. Her first novel, The God of Small Things, published more than a decade ago, won the prestigious Booker Prize. Last month, she published a collection of essays called Field Notes on Democracy, Listening to Grasshoppers, which focuses on the dark side of democracy in contemporary India. She joins us from the capital of India, New Delhi, to talk about her advocacy work and the failures of democracy. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Anand. Let's look firstly at the collection of essays that has just been published. It is, as I said, a harsh criticism of contemporary India today. What, in your view, is wrong with Indian democracy? Is it a country that is growing too fast, where economic growth, although creating an economic power, is at the same time deepening inequalities uh, between different groups in India? Well, yes, it's be beginning to increasingly, increasingly look as if this sort of urge to the 10% growth rate and democracy are both uh, mutually incompatible in some way because this growth has been based on an extractive, you know, it's, it has an extractive nature and it's been based on the displacement of millions of people off their lands. It's been based on extracting minerals and you know, harnessing rivers in a way that's ecologically utterly dis destructive. And all of this has been done uh, sort of keeping to the rituals of democracy, but sort of emptying them out. So you have the courts and the press and the police pretending to do their jobs, pretending to act as checks and balances as the institutions of democracy are meant to. But in fact, all of them have stakes in this process. And so they are acting as cover you know, for each other, which, which sort of dismantles democracy right from the bottom, which is, which is what is very, very dangerous now. When you say it dismantles democracy right from the bottom, what is the alternative then? Well, the alternative is uh, a system which pays heed to the justice that exists in its own documents, in its own constitution, in its own laws. You know, all of these are being sort of thrown over, turned over, toppled over. So what, you know, between what is, what is promised and what is executed is a huge world of unconscionable injustice that's going on. So the alternative is that for each one of these projects, for each dam, for each mine, for each person that has been unjustly uh, held in a police station, there's another way of doing it. You know, So that is the alternative. The alternative is for people to realize that eventually this part is going to, I mean, in just in the self-interest of the powerful now, it's time for them to realize that it can't go on. It's come to a critical mass right now. You know, India is in many respects uh, portrayed in the world as this beacon of democracy, uh, of liberalism, of tolerance. Uh, it's been uh, to that end attracting investments in the millions in the last few years. It is, as I pointed out, an economic powerhouse. In that respect, has it duped the world into believing that it is something that it isn't? Yes, it has. I'm afraid that's one of the biggest public relations scams that's, uh, you know, that's happened this century. This idea that India is a tolerant, liberal, and just democracy. I mean, we have, uh, we have a military occupation in Kashmir, which has resulted in the death of 70,000 people. We have military occupations in the northeastern states, like Nagaland and Manipur, where there's vicious wars being fought. And now, of course, we have uh, the government turning uh, this, this sort of occupation mentality into its heartland. We've had, we've had the genocide of uh, Muslims in Gujarat. 
where, where, where more than 1,000 people were slaughtered on the streets, 150,000 were driven from their homes, no justice. We've had 3,000 Sikhs slaughtered on the streets of Delhi uh, 25 years ago, no justice. We've had, we've just absorbed these things, you know, and now it's lying in, in our bodies like a kind of viscera, like a kind of he heavy metal in our viscera. And I'm just talking about the spectacular events, you know, the daily injustice of being a society which, which recognizes uh, or which, which thinks, can, which can imagine that you can have untouchables, that you can practice that on a daily basis that you have more than a million people earning their living, carrying other people's shit on their heads. It's, it's, it's a pretty barbaric society, and I think uh, we don't have very many excuses left. I mean, we have uh, this whole system of, um, of liberalization, which has dismantled workers' rights and has pushed the poor to the edges of survival, uh, also means it's a country where we have Millions, I mean, the world's largest number of malnutrition uh, children in India. And if you, if you look at malnutrition and you just apply it to the areas of you know, Dalits, which are the untouchable castes and the indigenous people, uh, the, the percentage is so high that according to any indicators, they'd be considered people living in conditions of famine, like in sub-Saharan Africa. I just want to get and, back. You know, the displacement is so huge. I just want to get back to yeah, one of sorry. the issues that you mentioned. Uh, there is a long report in this past weekend's New York Times about the battle in India between the military and Maoist forces who appear to have gained in numbers and strength in recent years, according to the New York Times. Now, that report says the widening Maoist insurgency is a moment of reckoning for the country's democracy. And it quotes you as saying that the government needs to open unconditional talks with Maoist groups and that the Maoists are justified in taking up arms because of government oppression. Um, could, could, any, could you justify the, the, the use of arms in any respect for any cause at all? OK, look, this is a, I mean, this is a slightly crude, uh, crude sort of understanding of what I've said. But I have actually written a very long piece in, in The Guardian this, uh, you know, just yesterday or day before or whatever about it. What, what is happening is, firstly, the Maoist threat is being exaggerated. And there is a reason for that exaggeration. And that is that the Maoists are in, in the forests of, of central India, you know, in a, in a, in a, in a swathe of forest that starts in West Bengal, goes through Jharkhand, Orissa, Chhattisgarh, parts of Andhra Pradesh and, and Maharashtra. That also happens to be the, 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 the area where you have the indigenous people of India, as well as an incredible wealth of mineral deposits, which runs into the trillions of dollars. So you have what the press calls the Maoist corridor is also an MOUist corridor, where memorandum, memorandums of understanding have been signed with the biggest mining companies in the world. And there have been several attempts to try and enter into these sort of ground clearing operations, like in Colombia. You know? So the government has armed militias, sort of tribal people's militias, who go through the forest burning, raping, killing. They have cleared 644 villages in the heart of this state called Chhattisgarh in, in Bastar. And the violence is so extreme that what I'm saying is people have the right to defend themselves from that. You know? and, and now there's a situation where the, the government has announced a military confrontation with these who are the poorest poorest people of this country. And it's calling out helicopters and the Air Force and 75,000 troops. And it is, this is the context in which it's happening. It's, it's a war of mining corporations. That's right, actually, because the government has announced a, uh, 
a counterinsurgency called Operation Green Hunt, in which it's deploying, uh, as you point out, thousands of soldiers in these areas. So this is really what you're saying, something that is being fueled by economic interests, by maximizing profits, by the corporate takeover of parts of India, rather than anything political. Absolutely, absolutely. This is, I mean, everybody knows that now, you know, uh, it's, 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 uh, there are, there are, I mean, some, in some areas where they are surround, which they've surrounded with troops, there aren't any Maoists, but there are lots of MOUs, you know, and the, there is not just the Maoists. I mean, one of the thing, one of the real problems here is that this whole business, this whole sort of uh, impetus to this growth rate has now created a situation in which you have so many millions of displaced people. You have so many kinds of struggles in India. Not all of them are armed. The Maoists are just one group. There are many, many, many nonviolent resistance groups who are all being tarred with the same brush. And, and what I say is that in order, to, in order to keep up this growth rate, the Home Minister has said that he wants 85% of Indian people off their lands and in the cities, which means moving something like 500 million people. You can only do this if you're a military state. You need to militarize. In order to militarize, you need an enemy. And that enemy are the Maoists. And, and it's a complete exaggeration what is being the figures that are being put out of this so-called Maoist affected areas. And in any case, let me say this, that 99% of the Maoists are indigenous people who are living in conditions of near starvation. We're talking to Arundhati Roy, the Indian author, political commentator and activist. She's talking to us from New Delhi. We're going to take a break right now. More of our discussion with Arundhati Roy in a moment. Stay with us.